Okay, according to the clock, it is 3.30. Time for us to start. So thank you for uh, joining me during this time together. My name is Joe Peprocki, and I'm the National Consultant for Faith Formation at Loyola Press, a Jesuit ministry in Chicago, just about 90 minutes away from here. Uh, so I was able to just uh, drive over and pop in, spend some time with you. I'm really honored to, to have this time to spend with you um, talking about homiletics. Uh, I'm honored that Father Mike Connor has invited me uh, to be a part of this wonderful gathering. As he mentioned in his letter to me, we worked together uh, at a uh, national conference on Christian initiation in Chicago about two years ago. And he wrote me afterwards and he said, uh, while I know that you're not technically a homiletician, he <laughs> says that I do believe that your approach, your style and the experience you have can help those uh, who are homileticians. Uh, and, and so I'm very honored to, to have this opportunity. My primary work is with catechists, but something that I have been told over the years is that I have a preaching style of teaching. And, uh, and so I, and I also, uh, of the number of books that I've written, I've been told I have a preaching style of writing. So I think that's what Father Mike uh, saw in me. And I find a lot, of, um, a lot of parallels between being a catechist and being a preacher. Uh, and in fact, when I'm speaking to catechists, uh, I will very often say, uh, the point I'm about to make holds true for anyone who's a preacher, anyone who's preaching homilies. So I'm gonna point out many of those similarities today and, uh, and show how I really believe that, that preaching is at the heart of uh, our call to evangelize. Uh, it's what the disciples did so well that made the church grow in its early stages. It was they, they preached to people and, and set their hearts on fire. So let me give you just a little thumbnail uh, of some more of my, my background. Uh, I've been in ministry about 40 years. I started uh, as a high school religion teacher uh, in Chicago, taught at the high school seminary for nine years. Um, after that particular school was closed, I uh, moved into parish work and uh, was a parish pastoral associate and director of religious education at a parish on the far southeast side of Chicago, where the pastor I was working with um, was very happy to let me uh, preach or give a reflection whenever uh, there were children involved. And as the DRE, we often had family masses and so on. So I had uh, a wonderful experience there being able to, to get uh, some opportunities to, to preach in a liturgical setting. Um, after seven years in the parish, a new pastor came in and uh, didn't want me, <laughs> so I moved to diocesan work and I went to the office for catechesis in uh, the Archdiocese of Chicago as a catechist uh, consultant and did that for five years until Loyola Press invited me to join their team and I've been with Loyola Press for 17 years. And uh, it's very appropriate for me, I went to a Jesuit high school in Chicago, St. Ignatius, went to uh, uh, Jesuit University, Loyola, for my undergrad, went back to uh, Loyola for my master's work, and now with Loyola Press, 17 years. So that's uh, half of my life uh, has been brainwashed by the Jesuits. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm still standing. Uh, but Ignatian spirituality is near and dear to, to my heart. And, and I think that also fits in well with the theme of this conference. That, that, uh, we're talking about spiritual leadership, even in catechesis. I try to stress that the importance of touching people's spirits and their hearts, it's that we can't just aim for the head. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later on as we go through. Uh, so that's uh, enough about my background. Um, I'm going to be drawing from a, a couple of my books uh, uh, today, and one is called Under the Influence of Jesus and the second one is a church on the move. I'm not sure if they have those out at the tables, but I have a few copies I can sell out of my trunk uh, if anyone's interested. So we could just talk about that 
later on. So, well, let's get moving. We got lots to, uh, to cover. And I want to stress that before we do anything else, the purpose of preaching is to give people heartburn. Okay, this is something I have believed for a long time. Uh, obviously, this is, this is not the kind of heartburn that we're talking about. The kind of heartburn that uh, you and I as preachers uh, are to be instilling in people is this kind of heartburn. Okay, the heart, kind of heartburn that the two disciples on the road to Emmaus experienced, that when they heard Jesus teaching and preaching to them, and then in the midst of a liturgical experience said, were not our hearts burning within us? And I believe it was the combination uh, of that, that preaching and the liturgical action that opened their eyes and transformed them. Uh, and so this is the kind of heartburn that uh, we're here to talk about. If you have the other kind of heartburn, I can help you with that. Because uh, I grew up in a family pharmacy. My dad was a pharmacist. My grandfather was a pharmacist. My uncle was a pharmacist. My brother's a pharmacist. I have a niece who's a pharmacist and nephew who's a pharmacist. <sighs> a lot of drugs in the family. Uh, I am a, a certified pharmacy technician. I, I keep renewing my little license, $25 a year. Uh, I do that as a, an uh, homage to all those people I just mentioned, and in case this gig falls through, you know, <laughs> I have something to, to fall back on. But there actually was, back in my grandfather's day, there was actually Peprocki's antacid. So the kind of heartburn that we're talking about today is the kind you do not want to get rid of. You want to get it and you want to keep it. Um, as, as preachers, uh, the, re the reason you're here, I believe, is because you want your hearts to be on fire. Uh, the worst thing that you can feel as a preacher is, is that the fire has gone out. You know, how do you set other people on fire when the fire is not burning within? And, and so this is why we're here, and this is why this conference happens. Um, my prayer for you is that you're going to leave here with roaring heartburn, <laughs> and Paprocki's antacid won't do a thing for you. Okay, you're going to take this uh, heartburn back and you're going to instill it in other people. Um, this is the kind of heartburn that uh, was instilled on Pentecost. Uh, the, the disciples knew that filled with the Holy Spirit, their hearts were on fire. We hear of tongues of fire appearing. This imagery of, of fire is, is very prevalent. And they went out and they set hearts on fire. And it tells us in Scripture, uh, in uh, Acts of the Apostles, Peter stood up with the eleven, he raised his voice and proclaimed. So he began preaching. I tell people all the time he did not, you know, uh, read to them 900 pages of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, right? He didn't, he didn't spout doctrine to them. He preached. He preached. And several verses down, you go from verse 14 to 41, those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 persons were added. Boom. <laughs> That's pretty impressive, isn't it? I think all of us would like to just get one or two people to maybe come around after listening to us preach. But he and the disciples and early church were able to set hearts on fire in this way. Um, and so this is what we're, we're called to do. Um, the, the heart of this kind of preaching is what we, of course, know as the kerygma. And the kerygma is, is a word that uh, I was introduced to in my undergraduate years. I heard it before. It's like, yeah, it's the first proclamation of the gospel. It never really meant anything to me. I didn't really know, you know, what was the big deal about the kerygma. Um, when I read Sherry Waddell's uh, book, um, and I, I, she identifies what um, forming intentional disciples, if you know the book I'm talking about, she identifies uh, the, the kerygma as a strategy. I had never thought of it as a strategy before. And it's a strategy that in its simplest forms, it's a simple, basic, to the point, inspiring proclamation of Jesus designed to convert hearts and minds. And I firmly believe that the new evangelization, if it's going to have any hope, needs to be more charismatic. That the charisma needs to be at the heart of everything we do 
I say this to catechists all the time, and now I have an opportunity to share that with you, the homileticians. Um, <clears throat> that, that transforming hearts and minds is at the, the, the very core of what preaching is all about. And so that's why I, I named my workshop Preaching That Can Change Lives. Um, I, I make this bold statement to catechists all the time. Uh, if the goal of your lesson is not to transform the lives of those in front of you, why are you teaching it? I, I really don't see any reason to be teaching that lesson unless your goal and, and objective is to transform lives. And I'll say the same thing to preachers. If your goal is not to transform the lives of those in front of you, why are you preaching? Why do we have preaching? Father Mike posed some of those questions during his introduction. What's the purpose of preaching? Now, when I, I read Sherry Waddell's uh, Forming Intentional Disciples, and I saw that she identified nine moments in the kerygma, something in me said, why are these nine moments or her nine descriptions, why are they familiar? Why do they seem like such common sense? And then it occurred to me, we watch, uh, anytime you turn on the TV and watch a TV commercial, we're being evangelized. TV commercials have 60, 30, 60, or 90 seconds, typically, to transform your heart and mind, to get you to pick up a phone and say, I'll have one, please. <laughs> I'll order that. I'll buy that. And so and what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to show you, oh, before we get to that, I'm going to show you in a moment what, what I mean by those nine moments. But I want to say one more thing about this notion of the purpose of preaching, to transform hearts and minds. Uh, how many of you have seen this logo before, FedEx? Okay. How many of you see the arrow embedded in the logo? Less than half. An arrow. There's an arrow. There's an arrow embedded in the logo. Sit, raise your hand again if you see the arrow. Now a few more of you do. Let me help you out. Oh. That's the purpose of preaching. Good night, everybody. <laughs> I've often wanted to do that. Um, purpose of preaching is to help people look at something that is right in front of them and to see it differently. And so you've stared at this logo a million times. You've driven behind it on the tollways. And you may have never noticed that there's this arrow in there. The purpose of a preacher is to help outline, like I did in that little arrow, something that's right in front of us, but we're missing it. And so we help people to see differently. And that's what we mean by transforming lives, is helping people to see differently. And St. Paul says in a letter to the Romans, chapter 12, verse 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is at the heart of our call to discipleship. And as preachers, this is at the heart of your ministry. Your call to help people to not conform to the pattern of this world. And instead, to help them be transformed by the renewing of their minds. That word metanoia that we all learned way back in undergrad as well. Metanoia is not just... a uh, conversion, turning around. It's the literal changing of a mind. Change your mind. Put on the mind of Christ. And so your job as a preacher is to help people change their mind. Uh, to help them get out of their mind is the, the phrase I like to use. You know, when people say, you're out of your mind. You know, that's what people should be saying about Christians. <laughs> you're out of your mind. Yes, we're all out of, out of our minds and in the minds of Christ. And, and that takes work. It takes work to, to put on the mind of Christ, to get out of our own minds, to not be conformed. Okay? So I said that, that I had noticed these nine moments of the kerygma that Sherry Waddell talked about, and I recognized them as strat marketing strategies, basically. And what I want to point out here before I go any further, I am not suggesting 
that we imitate TV commercials to be better preachers. What I am suggesting to you is that um, TV commercials, marketing, business, sales, etc., are using strategies that the church has been using for 2,000 years to transform hearts and minds, and they're doing it better than we are. So one time I gave this presentation without that disclaimer, and someone came up during the break very angry and said, I hate this presentation. I said, oh, excuse me, why? He said, because I hate TV commercials. They're stupid. I said, okay, I'm not suggesting that we pretend that we're doing TV commercials. I'm pointing out strategies uh, that if you look at the proclamation of the gospel, especially in Acts of the Apostles, you will find these there. These strategies. So let's watch a TV commercial. Uh, John helped me to make sure this runs. Uh, and this is a, a typical TV commercial. And after it's done, I'm going to deconstruct it and show you the nine moments that are present in this and almost every TV commercial. When you're not at a table, nothing is stable. Old-fashioned TV trays are okay, but you're always too far away. Hi, David Jones with The Table Mate, the transformable table that slides to you, making everything you do more comfortable. Wow, you that's wonderful. This is excellent. Wow. This is perfect. It really is. Whether you're eating, reading, or playing a game, Table Mate's ingenious design lets you sit back and slide the table right up to your body. And with the built-in adjustable cup holder, no matter what position your table mate's in, your cup will stay in. What do you think? That's very convenient. That's very convenient. The condensation isn't getting all over making a mess. Cross leg tables get stuck in the rug, but table mate's L-shaped legs easily slide over any surface. Table mate easily adjusts to six different heights and three comfortable angles. It's like having 18 tables in one. It's strong enough to hold up to 50 pounds, and it still slides with just a finger. Amazing! TableMate easily transforms from a home workstation to a yummy snack server in a snap. And if your apartment doesn't have room for a desk, TableMate works best. The raised lip makes sure nothing slides or rolls off. And when it comes to game day or family movie night, a TableMate is just right. And when you're done, it folds flat for storage, and it stacks for easy access. You could spend over $250 $50 on all these tables, and they still couldn't do what one table mate can for just $29.95. But wait, call or log on now, and we'll send you a second table mate free. Just pay separate processing and handling. You get two table mates with the built-in adjustable cup holder, an incredible value, all for just $29.95. All right, how many of you want the table mate now? Huh? <laughs> Does anyone have the table mate? <laughs> I've actually had audiences with people at the, uh, who have the table mate, and one time a guy got up and he said, I have it, it's great. <laughs> and he started talking about it and telling people why it was so good. In 90 seconds, it's a little longer commercial than usual, that commercial is trying to convince you that your life is not complete unless you have the table mate. And many, many people, why do they make commercials like this? Because they work. Many, many people pick up the phone or go online and say, I'll have one, okay? Here's my order. Um, in this commercial, we're gonna see nine moments. Feel free to snap picture or whatever you want of the screen up there. I'll get out of the way. Earlier on when people started snapping pictures, I thought they were taking pictures of me and then I realized that's how you take notes nowadays. So um, what I wanna stress before we go any further too is that I start to talk about these nine moments in the, the kerygma, in our proclamation, I'm not suggesting that this is a template that you should follow as a preacher. I'm not suggesting that you sit down and say, okay, I'll give 40 seconds to step one, 30 seconds to step two. That is, I'm not suggesting this is a template. I'm suggesting these are ingredients. You mix and match them with your wisdom and your experience and your guidance of the Holy Spirit. That's what you do as a homiletician. But these nine moments need to, to be, these nine ingredients need to be present. Otherwise, it's like, you know, uh, sampling a recipe and thinking something's missing, okay? We don't want anything to miss, to be missing. 
All right, the first thing that happens in commercials like this is that they tell you that your current reality is broken, that something's wrong. So they showed pictures of people with traditional tray tables and what's happening. They're falling over, there's food spilling, they're knocking things over, their lives are completely miserable. <laughs> but wait, now there's the table mate. So the first thing that's done is they point out to people something's lacking. There's something lacking, and now there's an alternate. There's a new way, there's a new product, there's a new resource, okay? Very important for first uh, crucial step. You know, how often do you hear commercials begin with, are you tired of, you know, fill in the blank. Are you tired of, they're immediately trying to tap into a part of you that's tired of something. Candidates do the same thing for office. Are you tired of blank? Vote for me, and I'll take care of that for you. So one of the first steps is tapping into the sense that people uh, have in their lives that something's broken, something's missing, something's not working the way it should. And we're going to propose something that will fill that need for you. The second step is that they identify a trusted source. So who is this coming from? And, and this, this person or this company is, is someone that is trustworthy and is accessible. We're going to break that down a little bit more about what we need. Um, number three, and this is the majority of a commercial like this, they spend time boasting of the amazing results. It can do this, it can do that, turn it sideways and it does it twice, you know? <laughs> and everything, they go on and on. It slices, it dices, it julian fries. Uh, all the amazing things that a product can do. The fourth element, there's almost always something in there that defies logic or is counterintuitive. It's, it's too good to be true. So in this particular commercial, it's when he picked up that huge container of water and he put it on that little table and he pulled it with one finger, <laughs> right? And while he did that, he looked at the camera and said, amazing. Right? He's telling you that this product is amazing and it can even do something that hardly even seems possible. Uh, I think everyone's favorite part, number five, but wait, there's more. You know, how many commercials do that? That's the part that I've seen the most smirks and, and giggles go up when we hear that. But wait, there's more. Order in the next 10 minutes and you'll get two for the price of one. All right, just when you thought you heard it all, they double down. Number six, there is an invitation. Don't delay, order yours today. Join all of the TableMate users. Join the TableMate nation, whatever you call it. An invitation, here's the phone number, here's the website, okay? Number eight, uh, build and deepen commitment to, to this product. You know, here's, you need to have this in your life. You need to not just, you know, have one of these, but this is gonna change your entire life. And so take out that credit card now. You know, three easy payments and transform your life. Did I skip seven? Oh, thank you. Thanks much. Number seven, provoke feelings. Uh, most commercials provoke feelings of some kind. In this one, I would say it's frustration. Okay, you look at the, what's happening when they have those old tray tables and they're falling down and so on. It's like, oh, frustration. I hate when that happens. Okay, and so commercials and, and politicians they try to provoke feelings. Um, that can be manipulative, okay? That's what I'm saying, we need to be cautious with these, these nine strategies. All of them can be manipulative, but how can we use them to, to our benefit to proclaim the word of God? Uh, we'll get back to each of these as we go further. And then finally, number nine, equip and empower people to become customer evangelists. I am not making up that phrase. There is actually a book, when you have a chance, go on Amazon and type in uh, how to make customer evangelists. It has nothing to do with the gospel, with the church. It's in the business section. So business people are using our language. Their idea is that they want to evangelize, not the gospel. They're not proclaiming the gospel. They want to evangelize, which means to create other evangelists. That guy who stood up at my uh, presentation said, yeah, I have one, it's great. That's a customer evangelist. He's 
spreading that commercial for the table mate further. Okay, so these are the nine, and what we're going to do right now is we're going to take a look at how these nine are fleshed out in the kerygma. Another picture taking time, so I'll get out of the way. And then we're gonna go through these nine, and I'm gonna point out how could these be present and manifested in your preaching? How could they uh, be an important ingredient in your proclamation, your preaching of the gospel? So I'll do this part from up here so you can take the pictures. The first part of the kerygma is pointing out to people that this reality that we live in is broken. We live in an imperfect world. Our lives are broken, but we are, uh, are proclaiming an alternate reality. We're proclaiming a reality in which uh, there is good news. It's at the heart of everything, we're saying, we have got good news. Well, if it's not good news, then we shouldn't be preaching. What is the good news that we have? It has to be an alternate way of living that helps us out of the brokenness of our reality. Number two, the trusted source that we identify is Jesus Christ. Okay, we have to name that source. I don't know how many homilies I've listened to in my 59 and a half years on this planet that don't even mention the name of Jesus. Jesus Christ, that's what this is all about. Okay, uh, number three, we have to proclaim Jesus' mighty deeds. What is it that Jesus has done? What did he do in the gospel? What has he done in the past? What has he done for me? Okay, we can't just keep it in the past. Jesus did a lot of great things 2,000 years ago. All right, we're proclaiming the risen Christ. What has he done for me in my life? We're going to unpack that. We're going to talk about telling stories. We need to boast of the cross. This is the counterintuitive part of our message uh, where we say, you think you've heard it all? Well, we're going to take it a step further. All right? The cross is at the heart of this alternate way of living. Number five, it doesn't end with the cross. But wait, there's more, the resurrection. We proclaim a risen Christ. Uh, I tell uh, my catechists all the time, we tend to teach in such a way that it's almost as if we invite Jesus to come into our classroom and tell him to sit in the corner while we talk about him. As opposed to saying the risen Christ is here and he's going to speak with us and talk with us and in, interact with us and we're going to encounter him. We don't just talk about Jesus, we interact. I tell catechists, you are not teachers of a subject, you are facilitators of an encounter. And the same is true of, of you as preachers. You're not preaching a subject, you're facilitating an encounter, which is what the whole liturgy is all about. We encounter Jesus in the word, and your preaching is helping people to encounter the presence of the risen Christ that they will then uh, receive in Holy Communion. Um, number seven, did I do? No, number six, invitations. There's got to be concrete invitations. People want to know, well, what do I need to do? Didn't they ask that of John the Baptist when he was preaching? And they said, tell us what we need to do. And he laid out the invitation. He says, here, you need to do this, you need to do this. People need a concrete invitation. Number seven, we need to aim for the heart as well as the head. We have this pendulum in the church that keeps swinging back and forth between the intellect and feelings. And, and we go through periods like perhaps we did the pendulum swung after the Second Vatican Council a bit more towards, you know, emotions and feelings. And then people said, oh, that's not enough. And then we, we wrote the catechism and it swung back to we need to teach orthodox doctrine. If we do that, it'll be enough. And that pendulum needs to be in the middle where we have both the head and the heart being aimed at. And one of the things that our, our people are telling us, especially our young people, is that we're not touching their hearts. 
So we need to, to do that. And let me finish this and I will start going through the number eight. We need to help people build and deepen a commitment or a recommitment to Christ. And I put that re in there as well because many of the people that we will be preaching to on a regular basis have waned in their commitment and have maybe they're back in church for the first time in who knows how many years. We were, my wife and I were surprised last night. My, our daughter mentioned, uh, she says, oh, well, we were at the, the four o'clock mass on Saturday. We, we looked at each other like, they went to mass? <laughs> we thought that was gone from their lives. But they, they've had a child and now they had the child baptized. So I think they thought we should probably be going to mass. So unfortunately, what they told me about was the horrible preaching they encountered. Yeah. Isn't that terrible? When someone comes back after being away, and what did they encounter? They said, oh, this guy just got up there and he just blabbed on about whatever came to his mind. I'm not sure if they're going to go back <laughs> after that. See, that's why I put that recommitment. You've got people who are who have tiptoed back in and are sitting there thinking, why am I here? And I'm sure I want to be here. And you're going to speak to them. Are they going to come back after they've heard you? Okay, and then finally, number nine, we need to be equipping and empowering them to be evangelizers, how they can go forth now and, and share that word with others. Okay, all right, uh, good. We're a, a half hour in, which means we have uh, 45 minutes to go. Let me pause at this point and not just ask for questions, but also insights that you want to share. Uh, any thoughts, uh, your own wisdom or experience or something that's bubbling up in you right now. So it doesn't have to be a question. And I believe there's microphones. Are those working for people to speak to? Uh, if you can use them, that helps. I'm hard of hearing and my hearing aid uh, is malfunctioning. I ordered a new one, but it's not coming until three or four days right now. So I'm sort of like, what? <laughs> so if you say something to me, I'm going to get real close and say, could you repeat that? So. Anyone have a thought, question, comment, insight they'd like to share on what we've covered so far? As usual, the thought that comes to my mind from a conversation I had today was when I think it's on, but I think you just need to. Yeah. No. Yeah, it's just not real the loud. Thought but John that I might had, adjust it. To, he'll be up That's there. okay. I got it tipped. The thought that I had today, based on a conversation I had with somebody, was off your comment about head and heart. It was that also the encounter with Christ ends up drawing us beyond head, beyond heart, into this dynamic reality. Yeah. And so that both head and heart are helpful and need to be used wisely. But based on this conversation I had with this person, the idea that neither of those were adequate. It needed to be drawn into something much deeper, um, an encounter. Thank you. God's love surpasses all understanding, right? It doesn't say that it doesn't involve understanding surpasses understanding. So we're inviting people into mystery. And mystery is something that we don't uh, solve. Our job is not to solve mysteries for people. Like Father mentioned about the Trinity Sunday, what a tough day it is to, to preach. I think one of the reasons it's tough is because we often think we have to explain the Trinity as opposed to inviting people into the mystery of the Trinity. Um, that's not easy to do, and that's very vague, but that's where I'm going to leave it. That's our job as mystagogues, all right, to invite people in and say, this is mystery. Isn't it awesome? And they're going to be like, can you explain it? And, no, not really, but isn't this awesome? <laughs> all right, I see a couple of hands. Gentlemen, go for your race to the microphone and see who gets there first. You gave us all of these so beautifully. What occurred to me is you didn't talk about the presenter. Because when we get up to preach, there has to be a, a sense that we belong here 
Well, we need to belong. They need to like us. Yeah. Or if they don't, we need to somehow or another touch them with something that we bring as a person. Yes. But that we're real, mm -hmm. credible, yeah. touchable. Thank you. Yeah. Authenticity. The, the, yeah, authenticity. Yeah. Authenticity. I hope that I'll be touching on that in step five as we get to that. But thank you for that reminder. Yeah, we have to be authentic. Um, I, I tell people this all the time, especially as a public speaker and a catechist. You know, I strive to be animated in what I do. At my heart, I'm an introvert. Okay? I would much prefer to be sitting in that back row right now. Um, but God has called me and gifted me with you know, some ability to do this. Um, I can only show so much affect and still come across as authentic. You know, there are some people who are extroverts can show all kind of affect and it looks, it, it is authentic. For me, if I sh I'm absolutely gushing right now with joy. This is as much <laughs> this is as much joy as I can show without looking like like a fake. So that authenticity do, do we come across as uh, hope, in other words hopefully the, the Joe you meet in the hallway afterwards is going to be the same Joe you meet up here. Uh, I probably have it revved up a little bit more up here, but the, it's got to be authentic. Thank you. Mike Here it is, here it is. Just another comment. Um, when you study commercials, not only is there content, but you can get a good clue as to who the audience is. Um, if they're car tires, well, you're gonna find those on NFL programs. If you see certain products, it's more directed toward women or children, or if, if it depends, uh, it's a senior citizen group that they know is out there. Our dilemma is that on a given Sunday, they're Every group, every age uh, is in, in front of us. And uh, sometimes you can steer it in a certain direction, but it's very difficult. It is very complex. It is, that's very true. Thank you for stating that. Um, I, I don't envy you uh, as, as regular preachers. By the same token, you know, as a catechist, we, we face, you know, similar challenges, but we have usually one age group that we're speaking to, and that can be an advantage. The difficulty you have is you've got uh, you know, toddlers, uh, infants, children, youth, young adults, hopefully, <laughs> and, and middle-aged people and elderly. And, and how do you speak to all of that? So, and I think most people I've spoke to said that you have to kind of aim for the middle, right? That, that you don't want to talk down, you don't want to talk over, you sort of aim for the middle and hope that, that everyone gets something. How about two more comments or questions? Yes. They actually had an application for all of the age groups. There was the young child who sat at the table, and then there was a senior. Yeah. So that I noticed that, and it kind of reinforced what I've heard before yeah. about thinking multi generationally when you're yeah. preparing that homily. Yeah. A big challenge, but and, we and saw it, it, there. it for in that it was like one screen, yeah. one picture, but a, a child watching that would say, "Oh, that's that's for me." Uh, and I think in preaching, we can do the same thing. You can, just one line can reach out. Let's say you're trying to tap into some examples of pe people's brokenness in their lives, and you say something about, or being bullied at school. Okay, a kid's gonna perk up all of a sudden. It's like, oh, okay. The, the other things you talked about, you know, unemployment and immigration problems, you know, or whatever, and then you said bullying. It's like, oh, now you're speaking to me. Thank you. About one more, yes, sir. We'll, we'll have more time. Uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, just an observation on your effective marketing. You didn't mention anything about the price. <laughs> and if well, you, there was a price on if, there. Yeah, I know, but you didn't oh, on our charisma. Yes, well, yes, and in your effective marketing or charisma, but in for the TV commercial. Okay. The last. 30 seconds of that commercial was about the offer, two for oh, one okay. and all those things. Yes. And you didn't mention that, which I think is good. Okay, oh, okay. Yeah, and, 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 but it shows the value because what they did was they solved the problem. Yes. And, and so I think that's the other important thing here is they communicated the benefits. 
So they didn't yeah. tell you how that table was made. You right. know, it was, you know, stainless steel, yeah. blah, 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 blah. It was yeah. like, it, what was the problem that they solved? What's going to do? And so them? their message was one of benefits. And yeah. I think oftentimes our message is one of features. Okay. And I think that's a fundamental shift that we as preachers okay. need to really look carefully at. Good insight. <laughs> Thank you. You wanted to say something, then we'll move on. I really thought you might have a, something about the role of repetition. Yes. Yes. Absolutely, I agree with that. I, I tell catechists, when you teach a class, you should be able to name in one brief sentence the goal of your class. And if you can't do that, you have no business teaching that class. And that's the, that purpose of the goal of your class, you should repeat over and over again. It should be on the board when they walk in. You know, Advent, our season of hope, right? It's on the board. You're gonna say, today we're gonna be learning about Advent, our season of hope. And you're gonna drop that comment over and over again. This is a season of hope. So that when the parents pick up the child and the small percentage who say, so what did you learn in class? All they have to recall is one thing. Oh, we talked about Advent, the season of hope. One big idea. The homiletic, I learned that in a homiletics course. Uh, I can't remember the professor's name. It's Father Dick something. Very good. Not Fragamini. It was another, another Father Richard. Um, and, and when we were preparing our homilies, before we got up to deliver to the class, he would say, state the, the goal of your homily. And if you went into two sentences, he would say, sit down. Literally, so you can't, if you can't summarize your homily in one sentence, you have no hope of, of preaching it properly. And I tell that to catechists as well. So again, that's another overlap there. All right, thank you for those wonderful insights. We'll save time at the end for more. So let me try to go through these nine um, in, in a way that uh, is um, using our time wisely so we can get back to sharing some of that wisdom. All right, the first step I said in a commercial is they point out people's brokenness. One of my favorites of all time, uh, which I don't think they use this anymore, but you remember, remember the Zoloft commercials with that little, I don't even know what you call it. <laughs> it's a little bouncy thing. It was going along very sad. So this is for an antidepressant. All right, and the Zoloft, look, the, the little bouncy thing is sad. There's a cloud over his head. And this little thing is just bouncing, not even bouncing, it's slithering. Mm -hmm. And the, the idea is that, do you ever feel like this? And most people just look at that and go, oh God, that's me. <laughs> do I need an antidepressant? And I'm not making jokes about that. That's a very serious thing. Do I, am I depressed? Do I need an antidepressant? Um, pointing out people's brokenness is a very important first step. And then introducing another reality. But let me say something about this brokenness thing. This, this is why I think it, it, it really, uh, you as a preacher, I think, bristle at this. And me as someone who sits in the congregation bristles at this. The preacher who just gets up and talks off the top of his head, like when my daughter and son-in-law went. The guy just rambled on. No awareness of what people are bringing, the baggage people are bringing. And when I talk about brokenness, I'm not suggesting that everyone's lives are completely falling apart, but something in their lives that is making them feel incomplete, burdened, etc. So I know that my daughter and a son-in-law are burdened by being new parents. I, I, I see the look on their face. They're getting no sleep. Remember that? You know, <laughs> those of you who have uh, had children, uh, you know, they're, how do we do this? My daughter's going back to work this Wednesday after uh, being on maternity leave. It's killing her. I told her, I, says, uh, I said, this is like that Liam Neeson movie where I'm taken, where he tells the daughter on the phone, they are going to come for you. They are going to take you. He lays it all out. I said, you're gonna wake up on Wednesday, you will cry. You're gonna to go to work, you will cry some more. <laughs> I basically just told her, 
the, this is the, one of the hardest things you're ever going to do is ha going to happen this Wednesday. Every mother I've ever spoken to who went back to work is crushed that first day they leave the baby. And there's the preacher, blah, 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 just blabbing about whatever came to his mind. So I'm not suggesting that, that you have to somehow get into the minds of every person and figure out their brokenness, but go in there and realize what people are carrying. Now, I'm going to throw some stuff at you that, that I don't mean to overwhelm you or depress you, <laughs> all right? But in your audience, 20% are affected by depression. 40 to 50% have experienced divorce. 3% suffered the death of an immediate family member in the past year. One out of every 15 high school students has attempted suicide. 3% of your whole population have seriously thought about suicide, and that doubles for high school students. One in 60 children is on the autism spectrum. Four out of five adults are living paycheck to paycheck. 35% are dealing with health issues uh, related to obesity. But wait, there's more. Um, 10 to 20% were sexually abused before their 18th birthday. 30 to 35% have experienced rape, physical violence, and are stalking. 20% have chronic pain. 15% are experiencing poverty. 3% are suffering from bipolar disorder. 18% experience anxiety disorder. One third of all the adults are experiencing loneliness. Six in 10 adults have a chronic disease of some sort. 40 to 60% of adolescents are unhappy with how they look. And I could go on and on. I, I, and I'm not trying to be scientific in any of these. You can probably argue with those percentages. I'm, this is not a scientific presentation. What I'm suggesting is people are hurting. And they're carrying burdens. And think about that every time you're preparing a homily. How are you going to help people recognize that you recognize their burdens? I think that's part of the being authentic, this gentleman said. If you can recognize their burdens, they will connect with you. You start talking about something and they're sitting there going, yeah, that's me. Yeah, that's, I experience that. I feel that. I think that's absolutely crucial. Um, so in that, that homiletics course that I took, the professor said, so basically when you deliver a homily, a good formula to remember is that you have bad news and you have good news. And he, he said, it's kind of like the old Johnny Carson show. Um, he would get up and do his monologue and he would often say, well, I have good news and bad news. And he would tell a silly joke like, uh, doctor calls his patient and says, I have good news and bad news. Uh, we got your test results back and you only have 24 hours to live. And the patient says, oh, doctor, that's terrible. What's the good news? And the doctor says, actually, that was the good news. Bad news is I was supposed to call you 24 hours ago. <laughs> boom, boom. I have good news and bad news. Father Richard said, in a homily, you flip-flop that. I have bad news, and the bad news is what we're all experiencing. We, we are here in church because we're broken, and we need to be saved. There's no other reason to go to church than to be saved. We go there because we cannot save ourselves. And so we bring our needs with us. We bring our burdens. We bring our, bring our brokenness. And if you recognize that and empathize with it and point it out, you have built an, uh, an empathy, a connection with uh, the people that you're proclaiming to. And, and so... Keep that in mind. I've got good, bad news, and I've got good news. Um, and so what has to happen then is in our homily, we don't dwell on the bad news for too long. We don't want to depress people. I once remember a midnight mass homily, and the, this is back about 25 years ago, and the preacher went on and on about the AIDS crisis. Um, you know, serious problem, serious issue, but oh my God, by the time his homily was over, we were so depressed. He never quite got to the good news. He just made us all feel so terrible about the AIDS crisis. Uh, so we don't dwell on there. We point it out. We empathize with it. And then we say, but today, in today's gospel, okay, there's always that turning point. You point out, okay, we're experiencing A, B, and C. But in today's gospel, Jesus says, now you're on to the good news. So there has to be that turning point in, in your homily where you say, I've got good news for you. 
and we start to proclaim what that good news is. So I, I, tell, uh, I would tell you and I tell catechists, when you read your scripture, ask yourself, what is the good news in this reading? What's the good news? And then work backwards. If this is good news, what's the bad news that it's an antidote for? Okay? What's the bad news that this good news is replacing? I think that's part of your theological reflection. What is the good news, the, the life-transforming good news of this particular passage? And each of you is going to come up with the, by the guidance of the Holy Spirit with a different aspect. You're going to read a passage, and you're going to read the same passage on any given Sunday, and you'll say, the good news is this. And you'll say, the good news is this. That's the beauty of, of preaching. The Holy Spirit's going to work through you to, to call that to people's attention. So ask yourself, what is the life-changing, transforming good news contained in today's scripture? I just show you this because I talk about this alternate reality. For years, my son uh, went to this comic book store on a, a few blocks from our house, and I've always loved that title, alternate reality, to come into the store and enter another reality. And, and I'm thinking, that's, that's what the kingdom of God is, that we're inviting people into an alternate reality that's not out there somewhere, it's here. The kingdom of God has burst forth into this world, but with our normal eyes, we don't recognize it, just like the FedEx thing. You know, so you're helping people to recognize that there is an alternate reality right here, right now, when we recognize that Jesus Christ is present and risen and has defeated sin and death. Okay? All right, let's move on. Number two, we need to let people know that this is coming from a trusted source, and that source is accessible to them. So how often do advertisements say, coming soon to your neck of the woods? You know, so coming soon to a theater near you, or uh, opening soon in our town, in our village. It's coming to you. It's coming close. That's how we proclaim Jesus Christ, that Jesus is always coming to us. The good news is Jesus' nearness. Uh, Bishop Barron uh, taught uh, in my uh, Doctor of Ministry class something that stuck with me a long time. He said, we need to remember that when Jesus came on the scene, the Jewish people were still in exile. You might say, well, no, that ended 500 years before. He said, no, their official exile was done. They were allowed to go home. But when they went home, there was nothing to go home to. Their home was destroyed. Their temple was destroyed. Their homeland was destroyed. And they were occupied. They were still in exile. And the Messiah was the one who was going to come and end that exile. God would draw near to his people. And that's why Jesus unrolled that scroll in the synagogue and announced that the day has arrived. He's saying God has drawn near to his people and that's why they were, they were so upset. They're like, what are you saying that our exile is over? You, you're saying this? How can you, this carpenter from Nazareth, claim that our exile is over? And that's the good news. He's saying God has drawn near to his people. You're not, a, you're not alone, you're not in exile. And whenever people are suffering from brokenness, they feel like they're alone. They feel like they're in exile. And we have to proclaim to them the good news. You know, new location, grand opening, coming soon. And this is what we do during Advent. Advent is the season when we focus on this aspect of the gospel that is true all the time. You, you know that already, right? That every season that you preach, what you preach in that season is true all the time. But that's the season you're going to, to emphasize. So we preach Advent year-round. We're always preaching that Jesus is coming. He's coming to us. He's near. And that's the good news. During Advent, we, we emphasize that. So I told you about this exile uh, focus, um, this famous uh, picture of the people in uh, Babylon 
uh, mourning their exile, and you look in the background there, there's a tree, there's a harp. Remember, it says they hung up their harps. They would, couldn't even sing their songs anymore. And what does the good news proclaim? Emmanuel, God is with us. We're not alone. And so the people who are coming to church are sitting there often feeling that, that God has abandoned them. God cannot be found. God is not in their lives because it's not working out the way they thought it would. And so we're telling them, no, take a look at that FedEx logo. There's something right in front of you. You're just not seeing it. God is with you. God is with you right now. Um, I'm reading a biography right now of Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, and I can't help but think about that famous song, Carry On. Uh, this, this is the message of, of Advent and the message of the good news. Carry on, love is coming. Love is coming to us all. We are always telling people that love is coming into their lives. Uh, love in the form of Jesus Christ, in the form of disciples of Jesus of Christ are coming into their lives. All right, and so that, that trusted source is Jesus Christ. Uh, our evangelizing and charismatic preaching must present Jesus as that trusted source, and we need to be name droppers. Uh, we too often, uh, in homilies and in catechetical sessions, we hide behind very sterile language of, the church teaches us that, uh, or according to the catechism, paragraph 39, we are to do this as opposed to saying, Jesus Christ invites us, challenges us, commands us. Jesus Christ, naming the name, say the name. <laughs> say the name of Jesus Christ. Very important in preaching. He's the person you are facilitating the encounter with. You know, if, if uh, there was someone standing here and I was talking to you, uh, at some point, I'd have to say, so-and-so, this is so-and-so. i got to mention the name. Otherwise, you think, well, that's very <laughs> rude. Person standing there, and he's not even mentioning the person's name. Say the name of Jesus. Number three, we need to speak of Jesus' mighty deeds. Uh, you look at uh, TV commercials, and they, and they always spend the majority of time saying, it can do this, it can do that, it can do this. We need to tell people, what does Jesus do for us? He opens the eyes of the blind. The blind receive sight. These are Jesus' words when the disciples of John said, so is this the guy? You know, should we be following him? They wanted to know what's he doing for us? What can he do for us? And he says, go back and tell them, the blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the good, the dead are raised, good news is proclaimed to the poor. So you and I need to, to talk about what does Jesus do for us? How does Jesus open our eyes and heal our blindness? How does he cure our uncleanness, our leprosy? How does he open our ears to overcome the deafness that we carry about? Not in physical ways, but how does Jesus do these things for us? And I think it's very important for us to tell our own stories. We need to be someone, I'll explain this in a second before you think I'm going political on you. We need to tell our stories about this person, Jesus Christ, and what he's capable of doing. I compare it to someone giving a stump speech on behalf of a candidate. And of course, I had to make sure I chose both a Democrat and a Republican so that you don't think I'm being partisan in any way. Up on the right is Joe Biden stumping for a candidate. And I, I like that picture because he's pointing at him. So he's up there saying, and Connor Lamb can do this, and Con Connor Lamb will do that, and he's been this, and he's been that. And on this side, you have uh, Sarah Palin doing the same thing about Donald Trump. That's what a stump speech does. In many ways, that's what your preaching is doing. You're pointing at Jesus Christ and saying, Jesus is the one who can heal you. Jesus is the one who saves us. Jesus is the one. Do you know that Jesus did this? He did that. He did A, B, C, D. And, and he continues to do it for us today. 
We've got to, to think of how are we stumping for Jesus, persuading people that they need to follow him more closely. Just as someone trying to persuade an audience to vote for candidate A or candidate B. All right? And I think an important way for us to do that is to be good witnesses. We need to tell our own stories. Work our stories in. Um, I think if you can work some of your own personal stories in, that it become a segment of the homily, that's very important. I say a segment because sometimes people take it too far. And the entire homily is their life story. It's not what I'm suggesting here. We had a homilist at a parish that I, I was in years ago, and every week he preached, or every time he preached, uh, he was a deacon, he preached about his uh, late wife and what he went through when she died. And everyone was like, oh, sorry, this guy lost his wife, but oh my God. That's all he talked about. He just his, the whole homily was his story. And your story that you tell should be a launching pad into others saying, ah, I can relate to that. Okay? And then you move on, you say, how did Jesus lift me out? Okay? I've also heard preachers who tell their story and it's all just, oh, you know, you, by the end you're like, oh, I feel so sorry for the guy. Well, how did Jesus save me in this story? How did Jesus come to my rescue? How did Jesus transform me? So your story is important. Give witness, keep it brief, and tell how Jesus transformed. Absolutely crucial. Okay. I'm going to skip that. It's just that that's a whole other uh, idea about storytelling. That could be a whole other workshop. Okay. Number four, uh, we introduced this counterintuitive key. So commercials often use counterintuitive statements to get your attention. This is a diet plan. Are you eating enough to lose weight? It's counterintuitive. It's suggesting that you need to eat more to lose weight. Believe me, I clicked on that. <laughs> you know, I wanted to see, huh, how does that work? You know, uh, I, can, I could use to lose a couple of pounds in this inner tube and I can eat more. I'd like to know more. Uh, as disciples of Christ, as evangelizers, we are doing the same thing. We're saying, are you interested in eternal life? I've got just the thing for you. And we show a dead man. Anytime you're preaching, that dead man is probably hanging right behind you, right? In the sanctuary. And you're saying, this is the key to eternal life. And people are going to say, huh? What? And you're saying, yes. The key is laying down our lives for others. This gets at that point about the price. Here's the first mention of the price. <laughs> All right? There is a price, and it's called laying down our lives. And I'd like to point out here that we misunderstand, or I should say the average person misunderstands the notion of laying down your life. We always equate it with people who are uh, physically give up their life, first responders, soldiers, and so on. That's the ultimate example. But all of us lay down our lives all the time for other people. Parents who stay up all night with a sick child are laying down their lives. To lay down your life means to put your own needs aside and put the needs of someone else first. That's the cross. The cross is the ultimate example of laying down your life, putting your own needs aside to address the needs of others. And so we are called to invite people to lay down their lives. Evangelizing and charismatic preaching calls people to, to make this a way of life, uh, to dedicate their lives to laying down, uh, putting their own needs aside and putting the needs of others first. All right, but wait, there's more. I'm gonna move a little faster because I wanna finish and we have five minutes for us to chat. There's more. Uh, Jesus, that person who's dead on the cross behind you, that's not how the story ended, right? There's good news, he's risen from the dead. I love this little cartoon of a catechist teaching about Jesus dying and all the poor kids are crying. <laughs> wait, wait, he doesn't stay dead. All right, Jesus Christ is risen. 
Now, we just finished the Easter season, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't still be preaching that, right? Every Sunday, you preach the risen Christ. And, and I think that's, that's absolutely critical. Jesus is the cause of our joy. Why? Because he's alive. He's conquered sin and death. And if he can conquer that, he can conquer anything, including my brokenness, what I'm going through. Um, and so our proclamation needs to be uh, permeated with joy. That doesn't mean happy-go-lucky, you know, hi, boys and girls. I remember we had a homilist at a parish when my kids were little. And it was like listening to Krusty the Clown from, you know, uh, The Simpsons. Hey! <laughs> you know, I'm going to be fun today! And it was all about did people laugh. His whole goal was to make people feel like they weren't at Mass. That's what my wife always said. I think he wants people to feel like they're not at Mass. And so they all laugh and they say, isn't Father so and so funny? All right, that, that's, when I say permeated with joy, that joy does not have to be in your face. Come on, everybody smile. But a joy that says, oh, we are victors. Jesus Christ has, has triumphed. He's, he's triumphed over sin and death and we have cause for joy. So that's why we're here is to proclaim that joy and again, make, it, make sure it fits your personality. Be authentic. Um, don't just mention Jesus, speak of the risen Christ, all right? You know, drop that on people in ordinary time. You know, say the risen Christ today uh, teaches us because that's the Christ we're preaching, not someone who just lived 2,000 years ago, but a risen Christ who's present now with us. Um, number six, we need to extend invitations for people to take practical next steps. Somewhere in our homily, it would be good to say, and so in the coming week, you may consider doing A, B, or C. And some of those things might be happening at your parish, programs or opportunities. Some of them may be things they can be trying in their home. But we need to invite people. People are saying, like the, to John the Baptist, what do I need to do? And so I think at some point you should be saying that. And so I invite you in the following week, come to our parish mission, listen to uh, the speaker, come to the Sacrament of Reconciliation, um, spend five minutes at home uh, just in silent prayer. Just try that for every day, the next day, whatever it is, there should be some kind of a concrete invitation. Um, and so we need to invite people to practice that faith in their personal life as well as in the life of the parish. Um, number seven, let's aim for the heart uh, as well as the head. And by that I'm talking about provoking people's feelings. Uh, and that, that shouldn't always be limited to making people laugh, like I just gave that example. That was the only emotion that preacher could focus on was if I can make people laugh, I've had a good homily. Um, that, that's only one emotion. Uh, we need to aim for the heart. There's a good book that uh, I encourage you to look up. It's called Contagious, written by Jonah Berger. And he does a study of why do things go viral on the internet? And he points out six reasons, and I won't go through the six because we don't have time, but one of the reasons things go viral, something goes viral when it has touched people's feelings. So if people look at something like a, you know, a picture of a kitty and they go, aww, and they share it. <laughs> All right, because it touched their emotions. Or they see something that makes them angry. Oh my God, I can't believe this happened. Boom, share it. Things go viral when people's emotions are touched. You want people to leave the church talking about your homily? Touch their emotions so that they go to work and say, yesterday I heard so-and-so said this and it really, it really struck me. Or they go home and they put it on their, their uh, they, they tweet it out. Heard this today, preacher said this. Wow. It's not gonna happen unless you touch their emotions. I put that picture of Sarah McLaughlin. Have you seen her TV commercials for uh, animal uh, cruelty, stopping animal cruelty. Oh my God, by the time you're 30 seconds into it, you just want to die because it's so sad. You know, there's sad music playing and it shows pictures of dogs, you know, that are 
injured and you're like, oh, that's so sad. And then people take out their wallet and send money. Um, touches emotion. Part of that emotion too is dr drama. When you preach, um, you're preaching a very dramatic word of God. Be dramatic. Use dramatic pauses, like I'm doing right now. <laughs> Every time I pause, two or three of you look up. What happened? <laughs> okay. Um, I, I listened to a homily uh, several weeks ago, a priest in Los Angeles. I was at a conference. He got up and stood in front of the congregation. And he went like this. Prepare. Prepare! And he did it three times to each side. We're like, what is he doing? And then he went on to say, if you've ever seen the movie Billy Elliot, the dance instructor, every time Billy's supposed to do this certain move, would always say, okay, prepare! And then he would tell them to go. And he used that as his theme throughout the homily, and he repeated it. Every once in a while, he would just stop and go, prepare! It was very effective. He could do that. Not all of us are that dramatic, but you can use drama to, to make a point. And I do think that one of the most powerful ways is by pausing. Nothing raises the profundity of a moment like silence. All right, so we're not just preaching to help people feel good about themselves. We're preaching to help people envision a different world. It's like, Grab this picture of a moment where three people got together and said, we can envision a different world, right? Uh, Arafat and, and uh, what was his name? The Egyptian. What was it? Sadat. Sadat, okay. So I'm just using that for dramatic effect, that we're trying to, to transform people's lives and the world. Build and deepen a commitment to kingdom living. Um, products today are advertising uh, much more than what they really do. Diet products no longer advertise losing weight. They now say, it's not a diet, it's not a phase, it's a lifestyle change. There are people at work, we have a, a lunchroom, and people, we all, a lot of people bring their own food in, and there are lots of people who I see at the kitchen counter, they take out these packets of food, and they're chopping up this, and they're chopping up that, and adding a little of this, and I say, oh, what is that? Oh, this is the plan that I'm on. And they do it every day. And they say, oh yeah, they, they, we prepare all these meals, we follow this plan, it involves exercise and so on. And, and it shows their, their uh, lives are changing, their body weight is changing, and it's a lifestyle change. Uh, that's important for us to focus on too. We're not just calling people to a little bit of self-improvement. <laughs> We're calling people to a lifestyle change. Um, to put on Christ every day. Let's move along so we can finish. Finally, number nine, we want to equip people so they can go out and talk about Jesus to others. Um, this is that book I was telling you about. It has nothing to do with the gospel. It has nothing to do with the faith. It's a business book, Creating Customer Evangelists. That's what you want to do. You want people to go out and say, today, uh, they, you want them to go out and tweet, put on their Facebook, tell their coworkers, tell their family. Uh, preacher said this today. And maybe it's just one line. And encourage them to do it. I don't think that's being arrogant. If you're confident in your homily, tell people, I'm going to go sit down now after my homily, take your phone out and tweet the line that you thought touched you the best. Or tell them to do it after Mass if you don't like them pulling out their phones, okay? <laughs> I'm not a liturgist, all right? But, um, but people need to know that they're part of something bigger. I love this picture of military people forming a, a ship. You know, people need to know that they're, they're part of something bigger and that they play a part, that they're equipped to go forth now. And, and, and when they're being sent forth in that final blessing, that it really is a command. Um, I taught a deacon course years ago. How many of you are deacons here? Raise your hand. I taught a deacon course. And I loved teaching the, the guys and their wives uh, too. 
And I said, please do me one favor at the end of Mass. Please do not say, let us go in peace. The Mass has ended, let us go in peace. I said, there's no lettuce. There is no lettuce in the Missal. It's a command. Lettuce sounds like, think about it. You know, what do you think? What do you say we go in peace? It's go. You got work to do. We just gave you the marching orders in the homily in particular. You heard what we said, now go out and do it. Mass is ended, go in peace. Thanks be to God that we have this opportunity to go forth now.